And we're going to lift our voices to Jesus. We're going to give him all of our praise today. So come on, let's do that together. Come on. Let's sing this out. Come let us worship. Come let us worship our King. Come let us bow at his feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how his love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Come on, let's sing this out. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. Aren't you thankful for a God who does great things, amen? And he has done great things today, and we're so looking forward to what he has in store for this third gathering. We want to say good morning and welcome. Welcome to Spring Creek. We're so glad that you're here. If you're a Spring Creeker, uh, you, you are home. If you're new to the family, we want to say welcome. Maybe this is your first time you've been joining us over the last couple of weeks. We say thanks so much for being with us. And we'd love to know that you're here, that you've been coming, and get some information and welcome you into the family. The best way that you can do that is by using the Connect card in the seat back in front of you. You can fill that out one or two ways. You can use the pin provided. Or pull out your phone and, and, and use your camera to scan that QR code and fill it out digitally. And just to say thanks for doing that, we've got a free specialty coffee uh, to our coffee shop as a gift to you. You can meet our guest service hosts right outside in the lobby following the service. We'd love to give that 
to you. Maybe you are new to the family. Man, we love kids at Spring Creek, and we have a dynamic kids ministry that hopefully you've taken advantage of. But if you do have littles who are with you in service and they get a little fussy, we want to invite you to continue worshiping with us in our coffee shop. We have some great seating areas where you can continue to watch, participate, worship, hear the message, and kind of let them get their jiggles out a little bit or so. So I've got three. Uh, I know what it is, but uh, we love kids and families around here. Hey, we had an incredible Incredible, incredible, incredible Sharpen Men's Conference yesterday, and it was a powerful day. If you were there, you know what I'm talking about. Yes, we were so thankful for Neil Kennedy, who you're going to hear today in his ministry. Man, we had some amazing food and fellowship, but Neil brought some powerful words in our sessions about what does it look like to authentically be a man following Jesus, walking in freedom, and these altars were filled with men who were wanting to have freedom in their life, and then how to lead our family spiritually, whether we, we were married or even single or preparing for marriage, it was awesome, and I want to say thank you because, you know, that, that event was free. It was a free men's conference, free breakfast, gallons of coffee that was uh, that we drank, but it was free because of your faithfulness and generosity of a church to give to the Lord's tithes and offerings. And so as you participate each week, you're helping us do ministry right here on our campus, but beyond the walls of our church. So thank you so much. I know men were encouraged, families were encouraged, and man, we're going to see fruit from those seeds, Neil, that you planted yesterday in our lives in the coming weeks and months and years ahead, and I'm super excited about that. I want to encourage you, maybe if you haven't started giving faithfully or participating in worship through giving of the Lord's tithes and offerings, I want to encourage you to do so, challenge you to do that. See what the Lord does in your life as you walk in that obedience, as you say, God, this is, it's, it's a blessing from you. I want to give back to you. I want to sow into the ministries of this church. And, and we pray all the time to be good stewards of it so we can continue to fulfill the mission that we have of rescuing lost people, redeeming families, and raising up leaders. I want to direct your attention to our prayer points this morning. We pray for a church, a missionary, our church supports through your monthly missions giving, as well as a school that we're praying for. And our missionaries are Bill and Rita Moore, who oversee Africa's tabernacle. And they build tabernacles like what we're doing in Zambia, all over the continent. They did a desire to see a tabernacle within walking distance of every African. And we're part of that. Uh, we've been a part of that in Cameroon. We're doing that in Zambia. So we're thankful for them. We're praying for Memorial Road Church of Christ right down the street as they're finishing up their services. We've been praying and we're going to continue to pray for them. And then we're also praying for Cheyenne Middle School today. So would you stand up to your feet? Let's lift up our voices together in unison, thanking him for this day. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that we are in your house with your people. God, followers of Jesus have been doing this for thousands of years, gathering together in your presence to glorify you, to lift up your name, and we continue that today. Father, we say, have your way. We thank you for the giving and the generosity of your people, God, who, who give the Lord's tithes and offerings, their missions giving, and, and out of the generosity of their heart that allows us to do things like Sharpens Men's Conference and the ministries every week and, and engaging in ministry with our city partners here in Edmond, we thank you for that, God. We pray that you would multiply, that you would bless it, that you would open up the floodgates of heaven as we fulfill the mission that you've given us, Father God. We thank you for that opportunity to worship through our giving. And Father, we lift up to you, Bill and Rita. We thank you for the call that they have answered for decades across Africa of going and equipping churches and building tabernacles and permanent structures so, so that churches can have viable ministry in places where they're protected and not under a tree, but they're under a building. And We thank you for them, God. We thank you God, we get to partner with them. And we say protection over them, God. We pray blessings over them. And Lord, continue to use them as they say, we're not done. We're going to continue to fulfill the mission that the Lord's laid on our heart. We lift up to you, Memorial Road Church of Christ. I thank you for that church. I thank you for that congregation, the people, what they're doing in our city, and how they're preaching the gospel week in and week out. We pray that you would bless them. God, give them direction and vision and fulfill what you've put in their heart. God, because we believe in the big church, and we thank you for that. And we lift up to you, Cheyenne Middle School. God, I thank you for every student, every teacher, every staff member represented on that campus. I pray that they would have a sense 
and, and understanding that you love them, that you've made them, that you've created them, God. If, as there's representation across the board on, on their knowledge of whether they're in relationship with you or not, but God, I pray that you would make yourself real to them and that you would use the Christ followers who walk those halls, who hang out in the lounge for staff or who are out on the playground. I, God, I pray that you would use them to share your hope and love, to embody the kingdom amongst their peers and their co-workers and help them to bring life. Protect the teachers and students. Guide them and direct them. We thank you for that. And Father, we open up our hearts and open up our ears to hear from you today. God, we have a meeting with you. A time of coming into your presence. And so, Father, I pray against distractions. God, I pray against anything that would hinder us from meeting with you today as we lift up our voice in worship, as we open up our ears to your word. We thank you for that. And it's in your name we pray. Everybody said. Amen, amen. I'm going to invite our prayer partners to come forward. We believe in the power of prayer here, the power of prayer and the power of agreement of prayer. So if you have a need, personally, we'd love to pray with you, or maybe you want to stand in for somebody this morning. Let's continue to worship as we pray. I love you. fails me and all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God and all my life you have been You have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will see Of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest night close like no
Clap your hands to the Lord today for the blood of Jesus. We thank you for redemption, Lord. Thank you for that today. Michelle and I want to lead us in prayer over three particular areas among our family. First of all, you may have heard there was a church that was burned to the ground, really. God of No Limits Church uh, in Oklahoma City. And the way we have a connection, we have some family here among us, a part of our family that has family there that's been impacted by that. And we want to be sensitive and pray for them that the Lord would literally redeem and restore. 
everything that was lost. How many knows that church is not a building, but it's sure important to have one? Amen. And uh, they're without a building, but their ministry is still going on. Matter of fact, I was told by a family member that's here today, they, he, he said that th their outreach is still going <laughs> because the church is not a building. Amen. It's not a facility. It's a family. And we praise the Lord for what he's doing. But we want to remember this church family in prayer, God of No Limits Church. And then secondly, another member of our family, the Sperrys. Uh, we have prayed for them for many things, and today they need prayer again. Their little witness, um, this little boy, is being faced with a battery of tests right now. They had to rush him to the hospital last night with virus symptoms, but now his joints have begun to swell, and they are concerned about extenuating issues with him. And there are no answers that they have found yet, but we know the answer. We know the answer. And we're going to pray that the Lord would strengthen them, all of them, today. Amen? And then lastly, uh, the Dry family. Uh, many of you know, actually, both the Spirits and the Drys, they normally attend the 1130. The Drys are really needing prayer today. Charlie is, as many of you may know, Charlie and Anita Dry. If you don't know, Charlie has been suffering with bone cancer and, and he is in a really bad way today. They've asked us to come to their house immediately after the third service. We're believing that before we get there, there's a remarkable turnaround for them. Would you just join your voices with me and Michelle? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you are working in churches like God of No Limits. And we thank you that you're restoring and redeeming all that has been lost there. You are going to get the praise and the glory out of this. I thank you, Lord, that you're working in every member of that church and especially those that we're connected with because of our relationship to them. We pray that you would encourage their hearts, help them to feel your love, your purpose shining through all of this tragedy, Lord. And we thank you for doing all that you do in times like this. And we're sending your presence there by our prayers right now to encourage and strengthen them. Father, we pray for the Sperrys today. Oh, Lord, we're asking you for a miracle for witness. We're calling his name to you right now. This little witness is going to be a witness for you, both now and in his future. And we're declaring wholeness and wellness in his body. We agree with you, Lord. By your stripes, he is healed. Witness is healed in Jesus' name. Now manifest that healing, we pray. Give doctors wisdom. Give dad and mom strength and peace. Let the pain go from his little body. Protect Michael J. Lynn, watchman, witness, and waken, Father. We ask you, Lord, that you would just cover them with your love and care right now. In Jesus' name, we're believing you for turnarounds. And as we're praying for turnarounds, we're praying for the Dry family right now, for Charlie, that he would feel your love and care and your healing power flowing through his body, quickening him, Lord, receiving what you have in store for him right now. In Jesus' name, Lord, we pray healing for Anita. Lord, body, mind, soul, and spirit for this family. We're praying, Lord, a complete turnaround for them. In Jesus' name, be glorified out of it and soften the hearts of this family, we pray in the name of Jesus. We thank you that you hear us when we pray, and we're praising you for it. We're praising you for it. We're praising you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Well, we are having a great day around here, and today we are continuing our series entitled we the family, how the gospel radically transforms our roles as husbands, wives, children, and singles. And today we have a very special guest with us, a dear friend of mine. He was with us yesterday to speak to our men, and today he's going to speak to our families. And we are so grateful for Neil and Kay Kennedy and the, gift, the gifts that they are to the body of Christ they travel worldwide to strengthen the family. They have a ministry entitled Five Star Man, and I know you'll 
want to be encouraged to give to that ministry. We're going to bless them. So if you want to give, you can give online, drop it in the box as you leave today. You can just mark special guest or five-star man or Neil Kennedy. He'll tell you more about his ministry, I'm sure. But we have been super duper blessed by what the Lord has given Neil to share to us. Uh, Neil and Kay have been married for many years. They have three beautiful children and their families and, and now six grandchildren. And uh, they embody, model, mimic what it means to have a blessed family. It is such an honor to have Neil with us to speak to us today. Would you give him a Spring Creek welcome as he comes? Good morning. Kay and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning. What a great uh, weekend we had, uh, or yesterday, great Saturday we had. Appreciate all the men who came out. Uh, what a blessing to meet all of you and and to be with you this this weekend. And uh, you are so blessed to have Daryl and Michelle. Uh, I remember the first time that Kay and I met you at PF Chang's, and years ago we sat down, and I knew from the moment that we met that God's hand and His destiny is on this wonderful family. And so you're blessed, blessed, blessed to have them as your pastors. And amen, amen, appreciate that. And in fact, all of the staff, all of the team, what a wonderful, wonderful uh, atmosphere of faith here. I just love it. It's good to be a part of a fellowship of believers, amen? I've been around fellowships of doubters. I'd rather be with some believers, amen? Amen. How many know your circle matters? You know, some friends had a paralytic, and he, they tore the roof off, lowered them down so Jesus would heal them. It's important to know who's in your circle because not everyone near you is actually with you. Amen? Amen. You know, uh, I read the other day that statistically um, women who gain a few pounds live much longer than the man who mentions it. Amen. This man and wife and uh, his mother-in-law, they went to Israel on a trip, and unfortunately, the mother-in-law passed away. And uh, the embalmer said, you know, we can actually bury your mother-in-law here in Jerusalem for $500, but it'll take $15,000 to, to send her back to the United States, which would you prefer. And he thought for just a moment, he said, you know, I, we, we need to take her back to the States. And he said, well, that's a lot of money. That's $15,000. Why would you choose to spend $15,000 when she could be married here in Jerusalem? And he said, well, a couple thousand years ago, a man was buried here and three days later he was resurrected. <laughs> I just simply can't take the chance. All right, the men know that that's all the humor I've got, so uh, if you're ha going to have any fun, you've got to lower your standards and meet me there. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Hebrews 11, verse 13. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to communicate your word. I thank you that I stand in the office of a teacher. I pray that you watch over your word to perform. Your word will not return void, but will accomplish the purpose for which you sent him. You said to the prophet Isaiah that stammering lips will speak fluently and clearly. Paul prayed that I will speak clearly as I should, making the most of this opportunity. I pray that my conversation is seasoned with salt. Now give us ears to hear your word, and as we hear your word, we consummate the word in our heart to produce a harvest of righteousness in our lives. And in the authority of Jesus Christ, I bind any deception, any distraction, or any demonic activity that would hinder the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. They admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. 
People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country that they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. Instead, they're longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he has prepared a place or a city for them. By faith, Abraham. I'm, I'm going to just stop right there. This is one of those scriptures that it took me a while to grasp because I didn't understand how they were living by faith. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. There are times when you're reading the Word of God and there, you come across something like this and you've got to have to bank it a little bit. You've got to put it aside. You've got to wait because sometimes the the journey of your own life, the seasoning of your own life, it takes some seasoning in order to understand some things. And that's the case it was for me when I first read the Scripture. I didn't grasp it. I didn't understand it. Because my faith journey did not start out uh, young. I, 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 was, uh, I was raised a heathen. We, I mean, our family was drug addiction, alcoholism, and serial adultery. That was the norm for us. If anyone knocked on our door, we were Baptist, but we, we were not Baptist. We, we, weren't, we didn't know Jesus. I graduated from high school, and I started working and trying to make a living, learning that freedom cost a lot of money, and so I was out working, and I was working, uh, working in a coal mine uh, in uh, southeast Oklahoma, one night at 3 a.m., I had experienced enough in just four years that I realized my life is just not going to work out well. I was desperate. I was hurt. I was wounded. I cried out to God, and I asked God, do you know me? Do you care? And it was the first time I heard the voice of God. Young people, I need you to understand that you can hear the voice of God. My my sheep hear my voice and the voice of a stranger that will not follow. I heard the voice of God. I heard God speak to me. And he said, I do know you. And I call you by your name. And I've given you the spirit of a son that you may call me Abba. Now, I had never read scripture, so I didn't know what the word Abba meant. I thought it was a Swedish group out of, you know had some pretty good music. Uh, I, I did not know that that was Scripture. So you, you have to understand when I heard this, and then a few weeks later I get saved. Two weeks after that I get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Two weeks later I get called in the ministry, and the pastor asked me to be the youth pastor after one month of salvation. How many know that's not a smart strategy? But somehow it worked. It, it wasn't long after that, just a few months, that I really felt like I had needed the education to become a minister. And so I went to, I moved to Springfield uh, to go to Central Bible College and seminary there. And so when I arrived, you can, you can imagine when I started reading Scripture and I, I find in Romans chapter 8 that he's given us the spirit of a son that we may call him Abba or Daddy. What a confirmation for me knowing that God is my Father. I, I, wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't raised in this, so I had to journey my faith. I had to grow my faith. The first time I had to really express faith was when I arrived at Bible college and they said I had to wear slacks to class. I didn't, know any, I didn't know what slacks were. I was raised not to be a slacker. <laughs> you got to stay with me now. So I went down to Walmart, got three pairs of slacks and uh, four shirts, and I rotated and, and uh, started attending class. And uh, it wasn't just a few weeks after I got there that uh, Kay called me on the phone and asked me on on a date. And... Uh, so I said yes, and we started dating. She was a senior. I was a freshman, and uh, she wants me to tell the rest of the story, but I don't have time. So, so we started dating. At the end of the year, we're going to a banquet, and the, the banquet, you know, you got to dress up. And she says, Neil, you need to buy a suit. You need to get a gray suit that would match my dress, go well with my dress. And, 
Now, I had never bought a suit. I didn't know where to buy a suit. And when I saw how much money they were, I didn't know why anyone would wear a suit. I thought boots and wranglers were good enough. Here's the point. I had to believe God for a suit. That's the, that's the journey of my faith. That's where I start. And I go, to, I go to the Lord in prayer. I said, Lord, this is an obligation. It's not something I want. It's an obligation. I need you to help me buy a suit. And through a series of miracles, God gave me the money through a bonus at work for literally finding money on the ground. I mean, literally miracles. And I was able to go buy the gray suit then Kay said I needed a tie to match her dress, and she said it was pink, and I said, there's no way. I'm not asking God for a pink tie. She said, no problem, I'll buy it. Kay's spiritual gift is shopping, so it worked out well. So I exercised faith to get a suit, and it started this hunger, this desire to say, you know what, God is in this. God is partnering with me. And so uh, Kay and I, she asked me to marry her, so we get engaged. So I sell my car because I'd rather have a wife than a car payment. So I sell my car. She has a car. but I, So I go back to the Lord, and I said, Lord, you've helped me get a suit. You've helped me these, these steps through navigating this. I need a car. I'm asking you for a car. And sure enough, Someone called me and said, I have a car for you. I mean, God provided a car for me. My first car that God provided for me was a Chevy Chevette. I did not say Corvette. Chevette. How many of you remember those cars? I learned to love that car. It kind of had a rhythm when you drove it. I mean, it just, it had had a a, a strut. And so, (laughs) I'm, you know, God helps me get a, a suit. He helps me get a car. Kay and I get married. We plant a church, and God, we believe God for a little house, a cottage, and then we had to believe God for land and building buildings for the church. Here, here's the point of all of this. My journey of faith started with a suit, and now I'm at this season of life where this scripture makes sense. They were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. See, now that I have seasoning, now I understand my prayers have changed. It's no longer about cars and clothes and cottages. Now, all of a sudden, I'm praying about generations. I'm I'm praying about children and children's children. And I'm praying about things that I can only see from a distance. I... I don't have them yet. I may not even live long enough to see them, but I'm praying about things that are in a distance. You know what I'm talking about. I'm praying, I'm grabbing a hold of things by faith that are out there that that I believe is going to come to pass that maybe my children don't grasp yet, but I'm believing with them. Maybe my grandchildren don't get it yet, but I'm believing for them, and I'm casting my faith to a future. Genesis chapter 11 talks about a man by the name of Terah. Terah has sons. He has three sons. He has Abram, Nahor, and Haran. We don't know why, but Haran dies early, leaving a a son, grandson Lot. And so now you have Abram, Nahor, and the grandson Lot and the the daughters and and daughter-in-laws involved. And Tarak has it in his heart. He's living in a place called the Ur of the Chaldeans, which is the Mesopotamian Valley. It is the seat of civilization at the time. And he has it in his heart. I, I, I want to leave here, and I want to move my family. How many know we're talking about family? And I want to leave here, and I want to move my family. I want to move them to this place called Canaan, which holds a promise for my family. He doesn't understand everything, but he understands this. My destiny for my family is tied to the geographical theology of this land. It's important for me to get my family from the Ur of the Chaldeans all the way 
to Canaan, a promised land. And the Bible says that God revealed the gospel to Abram in Mesopotamia. So Torah gathers his family, and as they're journeying along, and it's quite a distance, but as they're journeying along, the Bible says that when they arrived at a place ironically named Haran, remember the son that died? Haran died. They arrive at a city named Haran, and the Bible says this tragic statement, when Torah arrived at Haran, he settled there. Everyone say settled. Everyone say settled. So when he arrived at Haran, he settled. But remember, where's his destiny? His destiny holds a promise. It holds a geographical theology of, I need my family here. It's vital. The promise of the future is here. And yet when he got to Haran, he stopped short. He settled. We don't know why. Maybe Haran represented a bitter morsel. Maybe a wound. Maybe a hurt. Maybe... Loss, maybe nostalgia. Nostalgia is an obsession for an unattainable past. I remember nostalgia this way. I, growing up, my, my, my TV series I had to watch was Happy Days. How many of you remember Happy Days? See, I'm dating you. Young people have no clue how good that was. Happy Days. You remember Happy Days? How many of you remember Happy Days? I remember, I love, now this is in the day when if you didn't watch it, there was no saving it. There was no, I mean, you just had to schedule, right? And I remember when I actually did the math and realized my mother grew up in happy days. And I had a new respect for her. I said, Mom, how cool was it to grow up in happy days? And she took a long drag off the cigarette, blew it up in the air, and said, they weren't that happy. <laughs> Nostalgia is an obsession for an unattainable past. And so Heron may have represented a hurt, a wound, a past, a loss. Something stopped Torah from going any further. You know, what I've learned is your destiny is not what God promises you. Your destiny is where you stop. Hold on, let me check something. My note said you would shout amen. <laughs> you know, I've learned the greatest temptation in your life is comfort. When you arrive at a place where you just don't feel like you need to go any further. I've seen it over and over and over in men's lives. When they get enough zeros, they get, they get so self-assured that they think those zeros in their bank is, is, is confident enough that they don't want to take any risks. They don't want to go any further. They stop the chase. And what happens in men's or people's lives is we get to a place where all of a sudden we're, maybe we've experienced some hurt and some pain in our lives and we just say, you know what, I just don't want to go any further. You know, I see it in Christians' lives where they don't have to go to the altar anymore because they had an experience one time and they were comfortable with that. They don't need any more of God. That all of a sudden the altar calls and the time to go down and spend time with God is not any important anymore because they've got comfortable. All of a sudden they don't need any, they don't need God anymore. They don't need to hear his voice anymore. They don't need God to remind them that you've stopped short, that you need to take another step. And then all of a sudden Genesis chapter 12 comes along and God speaks to Abram and he says, Abram, you're going to have to leave your father and your father's household. Leave everything behind and come to a place that I'll show you and I'll make you great. 
I'll make you so great that all of the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. I will make a promise and a covenant with you, and it's through you that all of the nations will be blessed. There is seed in you that every person on the earth will experience a blessing from. Can you imagine the promise? And God is speaking to Abram, you must leave your father in order to get there. Mark chapter 10, verse, uh, verse 11, verse 9, Mark chapter 10, he says, No one has left a father, or mother, brother, sister, houses, or fields for me of the sake of the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times in this present age. There comes a point when you have to decide, okay, I have got to, I have got to protect my children from the iniquities of my own father. I've got to protect my children from where my children my parents stopped short. I had to do that in my own life. I had to come to the place where I have to protect my children and my children's children from the alcohol, the drugs, the adultery. I remember the day my son texted me. And I was driving down the road and I pulled over. I don't always do that. I, I hate to admit it, but I did on this one and I'm glad I did. Because when I read the text, he said, Dad, I've just now realized the demons that you had to fight in order to protect my sisters and me. Someone has to step up and be the man. Someone has to step up and fight the demons. If not, your cowardness will make the, your children fight the demons you were too afraid of. God chose Abraham, Genesis chapter 18. He, said, he chose him for this reason. Why Abraham? And the Bible is very clear. He says, I have singled him out because I know he will direct his children and his children's children after me. Young man, would you, would you come here and let me, would you help me for a second? I need to illustrate something. Come on up here. Hi, what's your name? Uh, Manuel. Manuel. That's cool. How, call, how tall are you? Uh, six, seven. Yeah, I wanted to do that. <laughs> how old are you? Uh, 17. 17. You married yet? No. <laughs> Don't give up. So, Manuel, listen, I'm wanting you to get this. It's so important to me for you to get this personally and everyone else, but... Here, here's what I, I'm trying to get you to understand something about Abram. So Abraham gets this promise, okay? He, 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 his wife is 90 years old. He's 100 years old, and he doesn't have a son yet. This is not when you start planning for children. You understand? Don't, don't wait. Yeah. It's, it's, when it's nursing home time is not when you start. So 90, 100, he has this promise there's been a delay. We don't know why. He just lost all potential. He looks at his body and he says, you know, I just know God's promise is greater than my body, but I, I'm just going to continue to believe God. And, and so here's Abraham. He has this promise for years. He's still not having a son. And so God gives him this, well, we can call it a vision board. God calls him out of, hold on a second, a vision board, ladies, is like Pinterest, you know what I'm talking about. You're pinning something. You're believing for it. That's what God gave Abram. He said, I want, I want you to come out of your tent, and I want you to look at the stars, because if indeed you can count the stars, if you can name those stars, those stars are your children. So Abram steps out of the tent, and he's looking at these stars, and he's, he's casting his eyes, focusing, and finally Abraham says, Isaac, Isaac, faith is building up, and he says, Jacob, and then momentum's building, and there's a cluster of 12 around Jacob, and he starts naming those names, and all of a sudden, he keeps naming, and he, and then he looks way, way off in the distance, and there's a young man in Oklahoma named Manuel. 
And Abraham called you out. A man thousands of years ago believed for you. You're not an accident. It's not fate. There is a man who believed for you to be his son. Amen? Amen. God bless you. He believed for you. He believed for each of you. When you look in the mirror, you've got to understand this man that you read about, Galatians 3 is very clear. His sons are not sons of flesh. His sons are sons of the Spirit. And if you've made Jesus the Lord of your life, you are born as a new creation who Abraham believed for. You, you're, this isn't fate. It, it, it's not just going to happen. You got to take a step into the destiny of God. Isaiah 59 verse 21 has become a favorite of my confession because it says, my covenant, my spirit will stay with you and will be on your lips, on the lips of your children and the lips of your children's children. As Darren mentioned, we have three kids. We love our kids. We, they, we enjoyed raising our kids. We didn't have any of the blow-ups. We just enjoyed raising our kids. It was just fun. I love them. All my friends were telling me, Neil, it's just different when you get grandkids. It's, I'm telling you. And I was like, how, how good can it be? I mean, I'm, I'm excited, but, I mean, really, how good can it be? I was so naive. When I got my first grandson, I'm like, oh, my goodness. This is the reward. This is the reward for not killing your children. <laughs> and what cool names. Maverick Reed, Kingston Bear, Ford Mason, Davis Wyatt, Ella James Kennedy, Willow Darling. That's her actual name. How many know my kids are creative? So I'm like, they have cool names. I want a cool grandpa name. I don't want to be granddaddy or grandfather. I don't want to be, I don't want to be pops. In Oklahoma, pop is a soda. I don't want to be pop. I want something cool. And my kid said, what do, you, what do you want the grandkid to call you? And I said, I like cool daddy. Cool daddy fits me. They said, there's no way our kids are calling you cool daddy. They said, think about it. They're talking to their friends. Yeah, we're going to cool daddy's house. I kind of like it. They're not there yet, but I'm working on it. I slip them 20s. Call me cool daddy. You get it. Yeah, I'll bribe. You know what? Uh, my, my real motivation in life. My motivation in life is really simple. To be honest with you, it's not to be known. It's not to be famous. I don't... I don't care at all about that. I want to invest in men. I want to do what I can. I want to love my wife. I want to love my family. You know what I really want? I want to hear my children tell their children, we serve the God of my father. Because my father's God is faithful and true. He's never left us, forsaken us. He's always been there for us. My father's God called him out of a coal mine and gave him identity and established our family. I just want my children 
to have on their lips the praise of my God. My wife would take our children to school and she would say, let's put on the full armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, our feet are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We have the sword of spirit and shield of faith. We're ready to face the day in Jesus' name, praying always in the spirit. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm the head, not the tail. I'm the top, not the bottom. Angels go before me and make my way prosperous. So every morning they would drive to school and they would recite that confession and, you know, that would build their confidence. That would strengthen them and they would walk into school with the confidence that God is with them. You can imagine how moving it was and when we got the video of our children taking their children to school and our grandchildren are putting on the armor of God. What I'm talking about is this family that we're a part of is designed because a man believed for you long before you ever had a clue. You're not here by accident. You're here by divine appointment that God has destined for you. But I know this by the Spirit. I know that there are people in this room that have gotten to a place of a wound, a hurt, a pain, a memorial, or something that has got you from taking the steps of his promises. I've seen it over and over where sometimes an abuse, a molestation, or, or some kind of pain, even a pain in a church, has caused people to stop pursuing and stop keeping the pursuit of destiny. We have a God that not only gives you a destiny, but he gives you a, a, a redemption of, a, of the past. I led my mother to the Lord. A serial adulteress who I never dreamed could come to Christ. She came to the Lord. I led my 89-year-old grandfather who would never allow anyone to share Christ with. He came to Christ. My sister, when I was 17 years of age, I moved to South Oklahoma City, and I started my first job, and I had an apartment. And my sister, 19, with a child two years old, no, three three years old, living in our apartment. And I remember, and I still, if I drive through Nickel Hills, I remember my sister would drive through Nickel Hills with a glimmer of hope that one day her life would be worth living. She's now saved, and her and her husband are wonderful believers in Christ, and they can afford any house that they choose. All because of Christ. He gives you a destiny, but he also redeems your past. If you're here this morning and you know that you've stopped short of what God has for you, in just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer of faith for you to take a step of faith. Would you stand to your feet? I know the Holy Spirit has spoken to many people and taken this simple message and has somehow applied it to your story, your life. And I'm just simply going to ask you if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about your life and what you need to do to step out of the comfort or out of the pain, out of, to spew the bitter morsels. If that's you, I want you to just raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. You're in this room, and God wants to do a work in your life. Let me see your hand. Yes, all over this room. All over this room. In just a few moments, we're going to pray in the altar. I know that, but I've, I, I've extended my time here, and I want to ask Pastor to come up and close out the service. But after he closes this service, I, I just want you to know I will be here to pray with you that raised your hand. Pastor, God bless you. Yeah, this is a, a holy moment. We just want to honor you, Lord, as you're working in the hearts of people in this room. Come on, just pray with me right now. We do honor you. We honor you, oh, sir. Praise your name. Thank you for the deep work that you're doing in this room right now. 
We receive that work, Lord. We want to be in step with you. We don't want to rush. We don't want to hurry out. We want to allow you to do the work. We praise you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment. I'm going to ask you, if you don't know Christ, this is the most important decision of your life. We're going to pray for those here in just a moment that raised your hands. We're going to ask you to come forward as we have every service. We're going to pray that the Lord will bring healing. But the first decision to get to that place of healing is to say, I need Jesus as Lord of my life. I confess today that God raised him from the dead. I accept him as my Savior and my Lord. I give all authority to him to rule my life. If that's you, you've walked into this place and you don't know Jesus, you have not followed him, or you aren't presently following him, today is your day to make that decision. And I encourage you, I implore you to make it today. Make it today. This is so critical that that you understand the time sensitivity of this decision. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I'm going to ask you, if you do not follow Jesus presently and you want to make a decision to follow Christ, when I count to three, I want you just to lift your hand right where you are, okay? When I count to three, you just lift your hand right where you are. One, two, three. Lift your hand right where you are. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for dealing with hearts. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Father. Now, everybody pray this prayer. Everybody's going to pray it out loud. We do it every Sunday. But for those who raise your hand, believe it in your heart, okay? Believe it in your heart. We'll give you more instruction in just a moment. But first of all, the prayer. First of all, confession, okay? So join with me. Say, Dear God in heaven, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me and change my life. Today, I confess Jesus is Lord. I believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead. I receive my rescue. I receive my salvation. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Come on, let's celebrate that today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for life change. We praise you for it. We praise you for it. Now, we're going to sing here in just a moment. There is a Follow Jesus banner right over there. If you said yes to Jesus today, we want to meet you right over there and give you some information. For all of those that raised your hand a while ago to have prayer about a particular wound in your life or you want your family to be restored or you're wanting to work through some things with the Lord after hearing this message, I want you to come right now, okay? I want you to come stand all across the front and we want to pray with you. And I mean, we're going to pray with you, okay? We're going to believe that the Lord is going to transform and redeem and set free and set your family on a new track, okay? We're going to begin to sing and as they're singing, I want you to come. Let's rejoice together.
How many of you guys are thankful for the goodness of God? Amen. We're going to continue responding. And if you maybe didn't come down and you want to come down, our prayer team will be here to pray with you. We're in this together. We want you to know you're not alone. Let me tell you this. When you say yes to an invitation to follow Jesus, you're also saying yes to community, to relationship. Following Jesus was never designed to be done alone. And so if you prayed that prayer with pastor, I'm going to be right over here at this Follow Jesus banner, as he mentioned a second ago. I want to connect with you, celebrate with you, and come alongside you in this new journey with Jesus. Let me pray a blessing over you as we leave this morning. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you that you're redeeming. Lord, that you're rewriting, that you're working in all of our lives. And we thank you for the family of God and our individual families. And I pray that today this message would encourage us, would empower us to live this out as a redeeming people. Lord, that's what your kingdom is. It's all about redemption and new life. So I pray, Lord, that you redeem our families, that you redeem our city, and ultimately as we live out your kingdom, redeem our world. We thank you for that, Father. Use us in a powerful way, and it's in your name we pray. Everybody said amen, amen. Go be an epicenter of Christ's love. We'll see you Wednesday night at 6.30 right here.